Between 1803 and 1815, the Napoleonic Wars reshaped Europe. For much of this period, the French Emperor was the master of the continent, able to inflict his often arbitrary whims upon countries almost at will. Yet even he was never able to achieve all of his aims, and his plans were ultimately cut short by defeat. This video then will look at Napoleon's overall goals, as well as those of the major powers involved in the coalitions that fought against him. The French Empire of Napoleon held two overarching goals throughout the decade of warfare that followed his coronation, the consolidation of House Bonaparte on the throne of France, and the attainment of glory for Napoleon himself. All other considerations were simply afterthoughts. Of course, the practicalities of accomplishing these aims meant the creation of a more substantial policy. Napoleon himself first and foremost believed his continued position as emperor depended on military success. War had given him the throne, war would keep him there. This is not to say conflict was an aim in and of itself. He wanted peace, but on his terms. The drive to attain this success would push him into ever greater commitments. The most basic war aim throughout all of the coalitions was the preservation of France's natural borders, extending to the Rhine, which Napoleon had sworn to defend at his coronation. Expanding out from this, he was likewise determined from the start to maintain his Italian client state, the crown of which he had also recently taken. Italy was not held just for the sake of power and prestige, though these were factors. It also played an important economic role, serving as a key market, for example, for the Lyon textile industry, a town which because of this would become firmly Bonapartist. There were plans to eventually unify much of Italy under this single client kingdom, but they were never particularly advanced. Securing the Bonaparte dynasty, in Napoleon's mind, involved elevating his siblings as well. Thrones were given to Louis, Jerome and Joseph, whilst his sisters were created nobility of differing status. Today this seems like gross nepotism, and it was, made worse by the fact most were complete incompetence that often defied their patron. However, in the context of early 19th century France, explained here by Michael Broz, sharing public successes with one's family was actually expected rather than discouraged. Although Napoleon had largely given up on ambitions for a French colonial empire by the start of the war in 1803, he continued to see the only non-continental great power, Britain, as his ultimate adversary. What Napoleon intended to do with Britain should he have ever been able to cross the channel never amounted to more than vague musings. I shall be another William, he once theatrically declared. Although his comments in 1815, after the British Foreign Secretary Castlereagh had shown magnanimity towards France, are not those of a man who ever intended to act as a liberator. An invasion and decisive defeat of Britain was never a serious possibility, thus some sort of compromise peace was the only other option. Various feelers were put out by both sides, but ultimately Napoleon's demands in all of these, such as his offer in 1812, were that Britain should recognise his conquests and accept French continental hegemony. Hopes of defeating Britain led Napoleon into convoluted and counterproductive economic plans like the continental system. A European-wide embargo on British goods, routinely violated by even his own family members such as Louis in the Netherlands. This aim of defeating Britain was to ostensibly drive much of his continental expansion. Many of his annexations, whether it be the Illyrian provinces, the Netherlands or the North German coast, were done on an ad hoc basis to try and enforce this convoluted system. He hoped to eventually force Britain to a fait accompli and break its economic hegemony, but as France could never hope to match Britain as an importer and exporter of goods, replacing London's economic power was never a serious possibility. Anywhere French armies conquered, not far behind followed the revolution. Borders were redrawn, sometimes along emerging notions of nationality, though more often than not arbitrarily, to achieve whatever Napoleon needed at that exact moment. The French administrative model, based on the Napoleonic Code, was rarely ever outright imposed on conquered nations, lest it create resistance among local populations and impede Napoleon's looting of the country. Thus, whilst exporting the French Revolution was indeed an aim, it would always take a back seat to other objectives. The Third Coalition was formed by Britain with Austria, Russia and Sweden. One historian sums up the aim of the coalition as restoring the balance of power, which Napoleon was upsetting. 
A more specific concern for the monarchies of Europe was Napoleon's seizure and execution of the Duke of Enghien, proving to those such as Tsar Alexander that the revolutionary leopard had not changed its spots. Despite this, actually dethroning Napoleon was not the main aim of any power in the Third Coalition. Containing aggressive French expansion, however, was. Austria at the start of the war clung to the corpse of the Holy Roman Empire, but even arch-conservative Francis could see its days were numbered no matter what the outcome of the conflict, and so had unified his disparate realms into a single Austrian Empire. The Austrians were actually mainly concerned with their position in Italy during the war, and thus focused most of the troops there. Napoleon's coronation as King of Italy, as well as his meddling in Switzerland, were seen as major affronts to Habsburg prestige. Austria also harboured designs on Bavaria in the war, and French diplomats made great play of the fact the Habsburgs had threatened Bavaria with extinction five times since 1798 so as to draw the Vittles backs into the French camp. Russian aims were not really territorial either, but saw Napoleon as a destabilising influence that had to be contained. The Duke of Enghien had been lifted out from the territory of Alexander's father-in-law, and though the Tsar himself was not a devoted legitimist by any means, as Dominic Levin says, Napoleon's treatment of Enghien was by no means the only example of the French leader's contempt for international treaties and norms. There was also again the classic fear of France's rapid expansion, particularly in Italy, which threatened Constantinople and Russia's interest in the Mediterranean. In this context, Alexander's hope was again to check French expansion. For Napoleon, the crushing victories at Ulm and Austerlitz in 1805 turned the war from one of survival to one of conquest. His gains in Italy were cemented and extended, French influence in Germany was formalised with the creation of the Confederation of the Rhine and formal dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire. Naples and all southern Italy lay open to French armies, whilst Austria was delivered a humiliating check and forced to pay a large indemnity. The formation of a fourth coalition revolved entirely around whether Prussia could finally be persuaded to take up the fight. Berlin had actually intended to in 1805, but the Prussian messenger delivering an ultimatum to Napoleon had instead been forced to offer him an impromptu message of congratulations upon hearing the news of Austerlitz. Prussia should have declared war earlier alongside the Austrians. There was genuine fear, however, of picking a side in Berlin. The Prussian king, Frederick William, was supine, and though Queen Louise was a remarkably intelligent and capable woman that understood the need to contain France, even she was hesitant about a premature declaration of war, believing it would lead to dependence on Russia. The result was dependence on France instead in the wake of the Austrian defeat. Though Prussia claimed to be a great power, Napoleon treated her, as he did all states, as if she were his vassal. In 1804, Napoleon had had the British envoy to Hamburg, effectively under Frederick William's protection, kidnapped in a flagrant breach of international law. French troops had marched through Prussia's southern enclaves in 1805 with no cause. Napoleon regularly and publicly denounced Queen Louise, loved by the Prussian people, as a harlot. Worst of all, Prussia's influence in Germany was all but destroyed by the creation of the Confederation. Nonetheless, fear of war pulled Frederick William towards the French camp, with the Treaty of Schönbrunn in December 1805 committing him to a comprehensive alliance, as well as the annexation of the British King's fiefdom of Hanover. As always with Napoleon, appeasement led only to a new intensified round of bullying. The final straw was when, in August 1806, Intercepts revealed Napoleon had been trying to arrange a peace with Britain by offering to return Hanover. Although Prussia had long since abandoned any claim to dignity where dealing with Napoleon was concerned, this was finally an insult too far. An exasperated but still fearful Frederick William sent a letter demanding that Prussia's neutrality pact in the north of Germany be honoured. As Christopher Clark notes, even by Napoleon's standards, the reply mixed a blend of arrogance, aggression, sarcasm and false solicitude. Prussia's main aim then, more than any territorial goal, was to simply restore the nation's honour. But instead of holding the line on the Elbe and awaiting Russian reinforcements, Prussia instead took the offensive, and its well-drilled but brittle army was unable to match Napoleon's for speed and tenacity. The consequent destruction of Prussian forces at Jena and Auerstadt, and surrender of numerous well-supplied garrisons that gave up for no reason other than a lack of will, left Frederick William in an untenable position. French aims changed rapidly during this time. 
Saxony was offered peace so long as it was subsumed into the Confederation, with Napoleon going so far as to claim he had only entered the war to defend Saxon independence. After he had taken Berlin, Napoleon offered peace on the basis that Frederick William renounced all territories west of the Elbe. The Prussians signed an agreement to that effect on the 30th of October, but Napoleon then changed his mind and demanded Prussia serve as a basis for an offensive against Russia. This term was rejected and the war continued until the French defeated the Russian army at Friedland in 1807. Napoleon then made clear he wanted to end hostilities with Russia amicably, and even hinted towards his wish for an alliance. Tsar Alexander thus, despite assurances to protect Prussia, met the French Emperor at the small town of Tilsit. Frederick William was nominally the equal of Alexander and Napoleon, but was in reality left almost entirely out of negotiations. On a personal level, one cannot necessarily blame Napoleon. Frederick William was, to put it mildly, a pedantic bore. You shall have to ask my tailor, sir, Napoleon snapped when the Prussian king tried to engage him in a particularly uninteresting conversation about his uniform's buttons. Napoleon later declared his greatest mistake was not destroying Prussia completely at Tilsit. I'm sure Alexander would not have opposed it, he said. Prussia's actual fate was hardly much more generous. Frederick William had hoped to revive something like the previous offer of a border on the Elbe. To this end, he even invited his wife, Queen Louise, to try and charm Napoleon into concessions. Louise swallowed her pride and begged the Emperor to spare Prussia. She in particular focused on the fortress city of Magdeburg. But Napoleon, who knew of its importance from reading Gustavus Adolphus's campaigns, was uninterested. The beautiful Queen of Prussia really cries, he wrote to Berthier. She believes I came all this way for her nice eyes. The final treaty saw Prussia stripped of half her territory and population, lose everything west of the Elbe, agree to pay a large indemnity and allow French troops to occupy the country, along with the formation of the Grand Duchy of Warsaw. This interesting creation of Napoleon's was seen by many as a precursor to a full revival of a Polish state, partitioned at the end of the 18th century. Napoleon openly encouraged these hopes, but in reality had no real interest in such a project, for one because it would torpedo his newfound alliance with Russia. Neither France or Russia had started the Third Coalition with any serious territorial aspirations against each other, and this remained true at Tilsit, where Russia only agreed to give up the Ionian Islands. The Vistula marks the borders between our empires, Napoleon declared before Tilsit. And indeed, this was largely a fact established by the treaty signed there. At Tilsit, Alexander forgot all previous war aims of containing French expansionism and became almost sycophantic towards Napoleon. Yet his instructions at the same time to Russian diplomats show a cool and realistic grasp of Russia's situation. In return for handing Europe over to French domination, he was given support for a war against Sweden and a potential division of the Ottoman Empire was discussed. More importantly, he got a period of respite without the burden of an indemnity. The main concession made by Alexander was bowing to Napoleon's war aim of creating a unified economic front against Britain by roping Russia into the newly created continental system. For Napoleon, Tilsit achieved most of what he had wanted. Europe was now almost totally under his control, certainly not the original aim when the war first began, and his dynasty was secure. Indeed, his popularity in France, never overwhelming, probably reached its highest point in 1807. But Britain still needed to be defeated, and this quest to do so was to leave France broken and the Bonapartes dethroned. 